Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak in this debate. The cost uh, for rail infrastructure development has risen sharply over the years. In a speech that the Minister for Transport gave on November the 13th, 2017, uh, the Minister noted that the North-South Line cost about $160 million per kilometre, well, while the Downtown Line cost about $490 million per kilometre to build. Inflation aside, the real cost for rail development will continue to rise because our rail development now takes place in a highly built up environment. And as our rail network grows, we will always be renewing some part of the system, which will also be costly. So in this light, the rail infrastructure fund is a timely move. We want to avoid raising taxes, taxes substantially or borrowing at perhaps unfavorable rates when the time comes to make these investments, provided that the government can commit to prudently setting aside this money, the RIF will help us to finance these important infrastructure developments at the lowest possible cost. It is a move that makes our transport finances future ready. However, there are also other challenges involved in ensuring that our transport system is future ready. Sir, the government has planned for Singapore's MRT network to reach 360 kilometers long by 2030. This is, nearly, this is nearly double that of the present network. The RIF will provide us the financial capability to pay for these important investments. But we must also have the human resource capability to operate and maintain these systems, and we must have the public support that commuters and taxpayers alike are willing to pay to upkeep the system. Let me first touch on the human resource factors. Sir, our rail engineers and our transport workers perform a highly skilled and often tankless job under demanding conditions. In 2017, SMRT announced that they were on track to increase the engineering staff strength to 700 engineers by 2020. Now, this followed a 2012 review by SMRT that identified a need to triple engineering strength to handle the maintenance, renewal, and operations of future MRT lines. Now, Tripling your engineering staff strength in just a few years means that the majority of our rail engineers today are relative newcomers to the field. Sir, I do not doubt the training, integrity, or commitment of our rail engineers, but experience and expertise does take time to develop. And I think the question is, why was the engineering strength in our core public transport operators allowed to remain at levels that are manifestly inadequate to the task. Let me suggest some reasons. Under the old financing model for public transport, operators had to survive based on profits from the very narrow margin between fair revenue and operating costs. Now, there is little that our operators can do to raise the fair revenue side of uh, the box. So what they had to do was they had to keep, fares, sorry, they had to keep costs down. Maintenance and operations are cost centers. So the pressure naturally fell on engineering to do more and more with less and less. So this was efficient from a narrow point of view. The old public transport financing model was designed to push operators to minimize costs and hence to minimize the fare burden on the public. And because of that, we paid relatively little to operate a world-class transport system while that system was new. But we ended up paying for it later through deferred maintenance and poor reliability. And today, our rail operators are also paying the price. SMRT trains lost $86 million in the financial year 2018 because fair revenue simply doesn't match up to the operating expenditure required to provide a high-quality, reliable system. It is not hard to see the danger in this. Sir, I think it is important that the government put the financial model for our train operators on a path for long-term stability and sustainability. The government has already done so with the bus contracting model for our bus operators, a similar contracting model that mitigates fair revenue risk for our rail operators that also gets value for money through competition or benchmarking may be needed for the rail sector. It is not about rescuing shareholders or private companies. It is about ensuring that our rail operators 
and their core engineering capabilities have the resources needed to thrive. Of course, we must ensure that there are incentives to remain efficient, but the financial model needs long-term stability. A young, talented Singaporean must see real engineering as a viable long-term career where they can make a real difference. With support from the right government financial and training framework, our public transport operators can build the human resource capabilities for our future rail system needs. Now, let me touch on the issue of public support for these investments. Planning for our original mass rapid transit system took place in the public eye. Early studies began in the 1960s. The final decision to proceed with a rail-based system was only made in 1982. The high cost of a rail-based system versus an all-bus system were the sticking point. Now, I think we are all glad that the government made the decision to invest in the MRT. But the point is, the public was aware of and publicly debated these decisions to spend billions of dollars on rail infrastructure. Today, I am concerned that we lack a similar level of public engagement and shared responsibility for decision-making in the transport system. The Senior Minister of State for Transport is now chairing the Land Transport Master Plan 2040 public consultation exercise. This is excellent, but I would suggest that we go beyond current efforts. We must continue to involve the public as a co-creator of the decisions made in public transport, ranging from investing in MRT lines to determining the quality of service offered. These decisions have cost implications and the public is ultimately paying the bill. Now, this question of public support for our transport system has often been framed as one of commuter satisfaction. But I think that is a narrow definition. If you put huge subsidies into the system and you greatly improve quality, as the government has done in recent years, then of course the commuter will be satisfied, or at least more satisfied. The taxpayer may not be. But the problem is today, the commuter may be satisfied without having any idea of the real costs and trade-offs involved in providing a world-class transport system. So, in the financial year 2018, the Land Tran Transport Authority spent $1.5 billion on bus service fees and collected only $831 million in fare revenue. For rail, the Minister for Transport said in the Committee of Supply debates this year that $4 billion would be spent to renew the rail system over the next five years. Meanwhile, an NTU study commissioned by the Public Transport Council found that our fares were the second lowest among 12 major cities worldwide. Commuters may not realize that their fares are low because they are only asked to pay today for a relatively small part of the operating costs. I think the government must set out a clear long-term vision of how commuters will contribute to the longer-term funding and investment decisions for public transport. The Public Transport Council's introduction of the network capacity factor, which links fares to the relative supply and demand for public transport services, is a good first step. It means that when the public enjoys better connectivity and less crowded rides, they share in the cost of providing these services. But now that the public pays part of the system costs, they must also have a way to say when they have had enough. We do not want to force people to buy business class tickets when all they want is economy or maybe premium economy. There are no market forces that would allow commuters to tell us what is the right mix of quality and price in public transport. So the government has to do more to engage the public to discover this. Sir, I strongly support the bill. It places the government on a firm financial footing to continue to provide a world-class public transport system. I hope the government can assure us that in addition to financial capability building, equally strong measures will be taken to improve human resource capabilities and public engagement and support for our public transport system. Thank you.